Welcome to Safety Factor. My name is Ben Hankst, and today we're talking about avoiding OSHA fines while working at height. I'm joined in studio here by Kevin Muldoon, Product Manager of Engineered Lifeline Systems at Fall Protection from Mozilla, and Regional Sales Manager at Tractel, a company offering world-leading safety solutions for working at height. Dan Monchel, thank you for joining. So, a bit of background about why I wanted to talk about this topic on the podcast today. So, Kevin and I are both in Ohio, and recently I saw a story about a local contractor here in the Cleveland area who was fined over $400,000 for repeatedly being caught by OSHA not protecting their workers at height. And I thought that was a pretty huge fine. And then I started looking a little bit deeper and I found the same thing across the country. I found another Ohio contractor being fined for a million dollars in fall protection violations uh, in 2022. General fall protection requirements were the top cited violation by OSHA, and then four of the top 10 citations were fall protection related with either ladders or scaffolding or fall protection training. And almost all of 2022's largest fines were penalties for failing to comply with uh, fall protection regulations. So I thought to myself, why? Uh, why do companies not prioritize fall protection? So can you guys explain the psychology behind companies not prioritizing fall protection to their workers? I think one of the biggest things uh, when you're looking at it is it comes down to lack of education is people just don't know or they're not up to date on all the new regulation standards or it just falls into this is the way that we've always done business and they kind of get stuck in that mindset of we've always done business this way so why would we change it? Well, we've never had a fall and, you know, we've, we've never gotten hurt. So why would we do that? But, you know, the biggest thing is you're working at height and height's the danger, right? And what are you doing to protect yourself from falling? And I think, Dan, to your point, which is, which is a good one, is education. It's like, okay, so it's now an OSHA requirement to be trained if you're working at height. Now that just recently, at least for me, because I've been doing it for so many years, but that's 2017 is when they said, okay, May 17 of 17. After that, you could be cited, you know, for, for not being trained. And so I think that's, that's another thing that, that is new that, that maybe some companies don't know that they need to train their workers. And I think this is a really good thing that Ben's doing is, is, is getting the word out that why were these guys fined, you know, and why did they continue to do that, right? Yeah, so I guess that's like one thing I'm wondering about. So understandable the, you know, being a bit naive about things, but, you know, a lot of these companies are just like, they've been told by OSHA, they've been fined and said, you know, you need to start work protecting your workers at height. And they continue to not do that. And I just wonder what the psychology is behind it. Do you think you just won't get caught? Is it too expensive or, you know, well, my first point was, was it's education is I don't think everyone properly knows the rules and yeah, sure. Fall protection, you know, implementing that for all your employees can be expensive and that can be daunting at first. But I just don't think they know and they haven't been through classes. They haven't been trained by, you know, companies like yourself, Mozilla, or broadening manufacturers like myself with Brackdell. And unfortunately, what the case is most times is it doesn't really resonate or kind of they see the value in it until, unfortunately, something drastic happens, that there's an injury, a fatality, something like that. Yeah, I think the other thing is, is you know, you, you've gotten, you know, for uh, roofers especially, they'll put the harness on and they'll even have a lanyard and it'll be connected to their side D-ring and they'll walk around so it looks like they're tied off or they're compliant, but they're not. And if you talk to some of these guys that have been doing it for so many years, they're like, it slows me down, you know. Sometimes I got to connect, then I got to connect again, then I got to reconnect. And it just, you know, from a productivity standpoint, they're like, it's going to take me more to do this job. So I'm just going to take 
I'm not going to be tied off. I'm just going to clip it to my side, D-ring, and it, I can move a lot faster. So, you know, in, in their mind, they're like, I'm not going to fall. And to your point, Dan, that's when you really need it, you know. Yeah. One of the other biggest things is, you know, like you're doing in any job is making sure that you have the right equipment for it. Mm-hmm. And there's tons of different harvests, lanyards out there. And so what's the job and how, like, especially when it comes to fall protection, when you're picking your harness, is how much time are you going to spend in your harness? Because if you're just going up and doing something real quick, sure, all you may need is a compliance harness because it's something that you're only doing occasionally. But for your workers themselves, if they're spending all day in a harness and it's just stuck in a compliance harness, it's not comfortable. It's something that you want to get out of because it's really restricting. So if you are working at a job where you're going to be wearing harness for hours a day, making sure that you have the right one for the job so they don't have those issues and workers are more likely to be compliant and keep it in because, you know, just driving around through cities, sometimes you'll see that people will have their harnesses on, they'll be up on a roof, but they unstrap their leg which, you know, in the fall happens, it's not going to do anything. And that's just because of how restrictive it could be. So it just goes back to make sure you have the right equipment for the job and something that your employees are going to be comfortable in. So then they're more likely to follow the rules and obviously make sure that nothing happens. So does the responsibility, does it fall on to these workers who are just wearing their gear properly or they're not hooking up or does it fall onto the company itself and the culture that they have? Well, that, that's a good question. And actually the classes I teach in fall protection, one of the questions is whose responsibility for your safety, who has the primary responsibility for your safety? And the answer is you. Now the employer, you know, whether it's construction or general industry, 1926.501 says that the employer has a duty to provide fall protection. And that's construction. You know, 1910.28 says that's general industry, that you have a duty, the employer does, to provide fall protection equipment. And so that's how the two come together. The employee knows that if I'm responsible for my safety and the employer is, has a duty to provide it, so those two should come together rather than be opposed to one another. And in, in training, when... When employers find that out and employees do, then that's a good thing, you know? Yeah. And it, uh, the only thing I'll add to that is that the employer is also responsible, not for the equipment, but also for the training, training them. Correct. So they know all, you know, what they need to be wearing while they're working at height. Right. Right. And, and so, it, um, Ben, you bring up a good point where, you know, what, what's the behavior or why, why do companies do this? If they start with a JSA, you know, how we do what we do safely, you know, before they even get to height, the meetings on the ground and they have a, okay, what are we doing? Does everybody have their harness? Is everybody connected? Do they know where they are? You know, what, what they're doing. I think that it all comes together. It's not one is mutually exclusive from the other or is it isolated? It's a, it's a whole cohesive understanding of what it is. I think, and <clears throat> working with Dan these many years, we've had a lot of uh, challenges, right? I mean, to, to look at a hazard and, and control it and, and explain to them how we're uh, controlling it. And then once they get it, I mean, look at how many systems we've put up over the years, you know? So do you think it's changing? Are more people being receptive to putting fall protection in? I do. I do. I, I, I think that, uh, just, uh, waiting for this podcast and you guys setting it up and everything, I got three calls that, yeah, companies want, uh, they want to see, you know, our team somewhere. So yeah, we're, our business is growing and it's, it's, and we're busy. And that to me signals that companies are really understanding that they need to be compliant. And, and protect their employees. What about you, Dan? You got, you're seeing that too, right? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd say that over the, you know, the past few years, it definitely has gotten better. And you see more and more companies caring more about safety, making a priority. I still do believe that there's a long way to go because there's plenty of companies out there. Well, like you mentioned at the beginning, Ben, of these companies that are being cited, major violations by OSHA. But I do think that we are making pretty good waves with 
you know, spreading the word and making sure that people are educated when it comes to ball tech. And, and I think OSHA is doing a good job because what they're doing is they're saying, okay, this is a recordable. So if this roofing contractor has a recordable and they're looking for another job, and part of the criteria for, for getting that job is to having none or very few OSHA recordables, if you get them in their pocket, but they're, they're going to understand that, yeah, we, we've got to be safe and we have to work safe. Plus, nobody wants to hire somebody that's unsafe, you know? I mean, we're, we're in the field all the time, Dan, and you and I both know that. It's, uh, But we do see uh, a lot of companies that are really stepping up. They have managers, safety managers, that kind of thing, that uh, really are... Uh, really doing the bill. They're, they're really doing the job. That's one way to combat this mentality, I guess, is just with OSHA fines. But, but how else can you combat the mentality of just not using fall protection? Well, I, I think that to look at the objection of, of wearing it, if they think that their, uh, their productivity is going to be down or uh, there's some negative to wearing it, you know, to, from them doing their job, that's the thing. You know, their range of motion, if they think it restricts them from, you know, if a welder's welding and he can't get to the weld or a mechanic is, can't get their wrench to where they need it to be because they're being restricted. Um, there's so many uh, solutions out there that are not restricting the worker, and and we can help them with that. But I think that's 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 one thing. And, and Dan alluded to it in the beginning of, of, of uh, the podcast is that uh, – it, it, it's something that is education helps. And then once they understand it, then they'll use it. I think they, if they don't understand it, they have a negative connotation toward it. So they don't want to do that. Um, yeah. I think one of the other big things is that, you know, fall protection, it's come a long ways. It's not people just think of the hardest in the lanyard and, you know, especially over you know, the past five, six years. You know, companies like myself, you know, with Metrek Dell, as well as a lot of other fall protection manufacturers, we've come up with a lot of new great products and systems. So I think it still always goes back to that education is, hey, if you have a job that you think you're going to be restricted, that's where you need to bring someone else in. It's nine times out of 10. We're going to have a solution for you that isn't going to keep you restricted and you'd be able to perform your job, you know, as well as what you were before, but also being safe while doing it. And you know, the, the other thing from Mazella's point of view is we use Tractel's uh, lifelines, but sometimes we don't use their anchor points or their stanchions. We design and build our own if there's not, no product off the shelf that we can do. So that's the other thing. Sometimes companies look at it that it's such a complex hazard and hey, I, I understand you guys can put the line here, but this uh, anchor point, how are you guys going to do that? And we give them a uh, a concept drawing of the anchor point using Tractel's products. And they're like, oh, okay, that's how that works. So I think the complexity of some of the jobs just looks so daunting that it's like, well, screw it. We'll, we'll, we'll do it without fall protection. So what are the OSHA requirements for working at height? Um, in general industry, it's four feet, and in construction, it's six feet. So four feet is, is not very high. Do you think most people are actually tying off at four feet? I think that it depends on what they're doing, uh, what their job task is, but it also depends on their company culture. I can tell you that there is many companies that Dan and I have been to that their safety culture um, – you know, Metalco is one of them where they their safety culture from the top down is like we're going to be tied off and we're going to be compliant and we're going to be use JSAs and this is how we do our business. This is part of our culture, and I think that that's a good thing, um, really. Uh, but I do to answer your question, Ben. I think that it's the job specific and company specific. If they have a good safety culture and they use the products and they've been trained, all of that leads to, yes, they will be tied off. Yes, they will be safe. But if the culture's not there and the training's not there, chances are they may not. Yeah, I completely agree with what Kevin said. This culture at a company is huge. And I've been on tons of different job sites. I've been out with companies where 
where the cultures do it and it's kind of ingrained in their workers' heads that we're always going to tie off. You see them every single time where it gets close to that four foot, they're tying off, they're making sure that they're safe. And, you know, going back to what we were saying earlier is, oh, it'll take longer. Part of it's also just like anything else that if you're not used to it, store the first few times, it may take you a little bit longer. But once that's just part of your routine and it's what you do on a day-to-day basis, it doesn't slow you down at all. And you just do it without second thought, which is really where we need to get more companies to do. Because once you you have that habit, you're going to eliminate a lot of these injuries that happen on the job sites. And, you know, to, to Dan's point, I was just sitting here thinking, there's a lot of customers that we have had multiple uh, fall protection projects with. We started out slow. We started with training, maybe. And then the next thing we did was we put up a horizontal lifeline. Now we're putting platforms up for them. So we could see their culture changing and we're growing with their culture, making these decisions about safety. And, and it's really a, a gratifying thing to, to come in and see that um, happening. So, yeah, I, to that point, Ben, I think that the culture is a real big deal and, and the management of the company and, and what they believe. So to help push that culture, what are the potential consequences of not providing adequate protection for your workers when they're working at height? Well, obviously a fall or, or, or injury but I also think that a safety a safe worker, they're in their mind, they know they're safe. So they actually become more productive because they're not worried about the fact that they may or may not fall. You know, I was talking to a electrician and one of our customers, and he says, you know, at first I was thinking that this was going to slow me down, and it, it really isn't. He goes, it's just like putting on a pair of, you know, like a jacket or anything. It's like he's used to it now. So I think, uh, I think with that, again, it's just, it's education. It, it's just them having self-confidence that, yeah, this is what we can do. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, as far as consequences, obviously the largest is going to be if something happens to one of your workers, but if not, it's kind of the whole reason to bring it back to why we're talking about this is OSHA's really cracking down and it's not all the where you're getting fined heavily for violations, but specifically repeat violations, that fine just goes up and up. And if companies don't start abiding by their laws, then it's really going to hurt their pocketbook if anything else. Yeah, a willful violation is that, that and that's a repeat violation, is, is a, a very severe fine. And to that point, that company is going to get a reputation of doing things unsafe. And who wants to do business with somebody who's unsafe? I mean, that just goes, I, I wouldn't. So how can companies ensure that they're providing the most effective fall protection equipment and training for their workers? Well, it, you have to look at the job first, what they're doing, you know, um, and to Dan's point about uh, equipment has become so advanced. They have Kevlar uh, harnesses now, and they have harnesses that prevent like weld splatter if you're, if you're doing it. And that, you know, there's, uh, rescue harnesses that have a breathing apparatus on it. There's all kinds of different advances today. So it, it really starts with the job specific and what that worker is doing and their range of motion, because they could be doing a job and they could be, you know, six to 10 feet to the left or right. And then that fall protection needs to possibly change or go with them. It could be a monorail or something. So it's the fall protections following that worker to another area that could be hazardous. It doesn't stop. It's continuous. And so if they're at different levels, same thing. So it's, it's our jobs to make sure that we help them identify the hazard and put the best control. There could be a series of different controls to keep them safe or just possibly want. But uh, the other thing is, is if you can eliminate working at height, that would probably be the best thing because then you're no longer have a height hedge. Yeah. Uh, I completely agree when it goes to any type of job you're working on, you always want to look at specifics. When I think one in doubt, it's always making sure that you're asking those extra questions. So whether 
your contact and someone like yourself, the Mozilla, to say, hey, come take a look at this. Whether you're contacting a manufacturer, you know, like Tractel, that you're not sure, or even what you can do, and I've heard a lot, is if you contact OSHA directly, they're a lot more lenient and they're willing to work with you if they see that you care, you're trying to work with them. So I've heard of other companies, they've had OSHA come out and say, hey, what do we need to do? Because we want to make sure that we're compliant. And someone from OSHA will come out, they'll point out all the different obstacles and obstructions that you have, and they're lenient about it, but they'll give you, you know, a few days, a week, a month before they come back and jump again to make sure that everything's compliant because you were doing things the right way and making sure that you have all the right steps in place. And that's something we do at Mozilla as well. We'll go in and help you point out, just like OSHA will. Yeah, we do a working and height risk assessment. We've done it for several companies and, and, uh, it's helped them with their safety culture to be safe. I mean, we, we, we help them identify hazards and, you know, uh, one company in particular is actually adding on to their facility and they called us and said, well, Hey, we're adding on and we really like what you guys did, um, on our cooling bed. Could, we're doing a new cooling bed. Can you do the same thing here? So it's like they, they're, they're thinking about it and it's part of what their, their expansion plans are which is very gratifying for us because we know that they're, they're thinking about safety and being safe. So speaking of safety culture, if you're an employee and you're working in a company that doesn't have the greatest safety culture, how can employees advocate for better fall protection within their own workplace? That very good question. I, I would uh, recommend that they go to the walking working surface at height. Uh, at, they can Google it or they can, you know, any search engine and, and see what that requirement is. And then, you know, prior to either being employed or whether they're still employed there, they can go to their manager, their safety manager and say, Hey, you know, I've done some research and, uh, 2017 was a final rule that I should be trained working at height because part of my job requirement, as you describe it is, you know, working four feet or higher if it's general industry or six feet in construction and say, hey, I'd really like to be trained. Do we have a training program? And if they don't, then reach out and get trained yourself. It's, it, it, it's something that the employee or anyone can take action and say, hey, I know of this and this is the law and, and nobody wants to work for a company that doesn't follow the law. So... So that's you know, it, an employee should always be able to reach out to a safety manager or someone in their management and voice out, Hey, these are issues from service that I had, because at the end of the day, if that company isn't willing to respond, to listen to your concerns, I don't think they really care about the employee. And that should be something that would be one of the most important things, making sure that companies care about their employees. And at the end of the day, if you see that your company isn't implementing these, you know, by law, you can stop working. So I think the employee, they have multiple different avenues, but there should be someone within their company that they can go speak to advocate and have advocate for them. But hey, this is what we need so that our, our guys can get the job done right and do it well safe. And the other point to that is, is that the employee, a, a potential employee looking for an employer can see that the, uh, uh, the company is safe and does have JSAs and does have prep. They would like to work for that company. So they seek that company out. So that's a good thing. You know, it's like, hey, I'm, I want to work for this company because I know they're safe and I know they practice safe principles when, when we're working. That, that's a good thing. So in your opinion, what is the most effective way to get companies to prioritize fall protection for their workers? I think that the, the first thing is really coming back down to the JSA and analyzing the job that's going to be done at height and whether they can do part of that job at the, on the ground or they're going to do some of it at height or variable heights. Um, that's the first thing is knowing really the job task or function you're doing. And then after that is saying, okay, we're going to apply these controls to that. And this is how we're going to stay safe and while we're working at height. What do you think, Dan? I echo that, that I think it's really analyzing what's uh, at the job, what are some of your obstacles, obstructions to make sure that you have everything that you need. And I'll always say that if, 
it's going to come back to the education and the training because well, the more training that we do with these companies for employees start to see some of these obstacles themselves. And I think it's important because you'll see some of the best companies out there, they're doing, you know, quarterly or yearly trainings with their employees. And you really get a better grasp of all the rules and regulations, as well as what you need to feel safe, the more education that you do. And it, and it's great because it, once you educate somebody, you can't take that education away from them. And you, and you actually have uh, co-workers talking about safety. Recently did the uh, Cleveland VA basic law projection for 119 guys and at, at some of the breaks and, and that you could hear guys in the hallway talking about well, you have to identify the hazard. You have to control or eliminate it. And they're talking about the ABCs of fall protection and the hierarchy. And, and one of the managers just smiled and looked at me. He says, I think they get it. And it's a, it's a gratifying thing to see. It really is. So in your guys' experience, uh, let's say somebody's having a hard time convincing whoever's in charge to really take this seriously. So what has been the thing that's gotten you past those roadblocks with working with other companies to get them to start moving forward in protecting their workers at height? What did it have? Was it worst case scenario where they actually had a fall and that finally convinced them? Was it someone moving out of a position? Uh, how have you been able to get past these difficult roadblocks? Well, there's, there's several videos that are out there that shows guys that have fallen and then they lost their, They've been paralyzed for life. They've lost their ability to walk and that. And you can, and, and, and I guess that's part of, I don't want to say it's a scare tactic, but it's part of this is what could happen to you. But I also think that it it's, um, goes down to um, the individual and the individual job that they're doing. And, and actually the guys that are older, that are near retirement or still working, that tells the young guys, hey, look, you guys have a lot more advanced fall protection. You have a lot of things that when they started 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago when I did, you know, you had still had body belts and different things. And, and you kind of talk about the evolution of fall protection and how uh, good it is today, right? Even five, 10 years ago, right, Dan? I mean, there's so many advances, right, that – that's a positive thing and say, hey, look, this is what's available to you. You can get it through Mozilla or, or whoever, but this is what we can do for you. So it's, it, it's not like a negative, like, where am I going to get that? Or how am I going to do that? If, that? if those questions are answered, I think the individual will have more confidence that, hey, I know this job and I know it's working at height. And I was kind of skeptical at first, but after all the the training and the knowledge that I gained about working in height, I, I can do this job. How has fall protection changed? Like we can all think of the picture of the workers eating their lunch on the beam or people just tying a rope around their waist or something. So yeah. in your career, how has uh, fall protection advanced? What's, what are some of the technological changes that you've seen? I, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we've all seen the pictures like you mentioned, and I think it's, you know, especially over the past decade, when, you know, manufacturers are making this equipment, there, there's a lot of things that go into it. One is just how everything has, you know, look at technology, anything, how it's advanced is it's the same thing with fall protection. We have stuff that's more comfortable. You know, harnesses that are more comfortable. You have uh, like shock absorbing uh, pads and, you know, lanyards, things that are built in. So if you do fall, it takes so much of that stress off of your body that it isn't going to hurt. It isn't going to be as big of a deal as what it used to be. And there's a number of different systems to make sure that if you do, you know, before it was you were falling and it was catching you. But now there's a ton of, you know, restraint systems out there that are, will stop you from even getting to the edge there, it stops the fall from even happening. So you're not going to go anywhere. So there's a number of different things out there. And I know with Tractel, one of the things that we do is when we're making new products, there could be 
general or specific industries. One of the things is as we're working uh, on the prototypes, we're getting these products out there into the people that are actually using them to get their feedback on it to say, hey, is this something that you would, you would use? Is it comfortable? Are there things that you would like to see change? And I think that goes a long way because at the end of the day, we're manufacturing uh, products that we want people to use. We want them to feel comfortable with and trusting us and trusting, you know, while using. So let's get their feedback what they want. And we've been able to design a lot of products that are specifically for one of the people that are using them on specific jobs or in specific industries. Yeah. And there's just a lot of really cool things that we've been able to do over the past several years. Well, the, and, and Dan, great segue into draft safe and smart, right? I mean, I remember when we made those uh, samples and we, we took them out to our sales force and they were able to show the, the customer how it operates and use. And then for me, you know, I, I was always used to between 50 foot anchor points, right? You could have one or two guys, not five, you know? That's such a, to me, that was such an advancement that uh, it, it really uh, draw, drew me uh, to your company and, and, and the engineers in your company and, and product development, what you guys are all about. It's, it's, it's good. I mean, it really is, is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, just kind of going on Kevin's point, like what he was talking about is our trap safe. It's one of our horizontal life lights and it's a dual line system. There are too many like those out there. And normally, you know, especially say five years ago, if you are on a lifeline, you only have, you know, one or two people on it. And if you're falling, you're still, you know, from the point of where you're working to where you fall, you're dropping down probably 20 plus feet by the time that you have, you know, the give of the rope plus your lanyard plus just how tall someone is. But now we have systems out there that if you do fall, you can have, you know, four or five people up to it. And if there's a fall that occurs, you're not dropping more than a couple of feet. And so it's advancements like that, that are not only making it safer because, you know, it's not putting as much stress on the body, but it's also adding more things because one of the biggest uh, obstacles that you're looking at when it comes to lifeline specifically is your deflection, how far you're going to fall. And so if you're able to, like we've been able to, to cut that deflection down to fractions of what it used to be, you can implement these systems in a lot more different places because you don't need to worry about how much, you know, what's our fault there. Just how much room do we have? Yeah. And, and where you can mount the system either, you know, at your feet, you know, shoulder level or above your head, you know, there's different options for that. And their engineers have done a wonderful job in developing that product. And we have it in, in several of our co customers' facilities. And they, they, they really like it. You know, the other thing, Ben, you mentioned about uh, confidence. The other thing is inspections, right? If, if we're inspecting on an annual basis and then before each use the, the, the system, you know, that, that gives a peace of mind to a worker that says, hey, you know, our, the system's pre-engineered and engineered, and I know that it's been inspected following the manufacturer specification, manufacturer like track tunnel, and that gives them a, an added boost of confidence that my employer not only is giving me a fall protection to use, but it's also pre-engineered or engineered, and it's inspected. I mean, their actions are speaking louder than words there to 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 a lot of uh, uh, employees that are working at height. Well, I got to say, as always, if you have questions or there's anything that you have concerns, reach out to a company like Mazella, reach out to a manufacturer like Trectel, but there's plenty of people out there that are willing to give you all this training. And now more than ever, there's more resources out there than there ever has been before. And I think it's something that you now want to try to eliminate all these issues as much as possible. Yeah. And, 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 and actually it makes our jobs pretty fulfilled. We've been in it for a while. And, and when you, when you walk away from a facility that had no fall protection, had no, uh, JSA job safety analysis, had none of that. And then 
they call you again and say, hey, we, we've got a system we would like to put in like the one we put in before, it really gives you a lot of gratitude and, and satisfaction to say, hey, that company is safe, you know, and they're, and they're practicing safe practices, you know. Yeah. One of the last things that I'll add is that I think when you look at people that work in fall protection on a day-to-day -day basis, they're also some of the most passionate people about what they do in their industry because they want to see people safe and it's something that it really hits home to them and they care about. So just seeing that, how much people care about it and what it means to them because, you know, they're trouble trying to be ill prevent uh, injuries, prevent well, fatalities, everything like that. So it means a lot to so many people out there. And I think it's just great seeing how much it's grown over the past decade. Mm. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. All right. Thanks, guys. So, Dan, how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, so if you just go to troptail.com uh, and there, and you can view all of our products as well as you can create inquiries. So if you have questions on any product specifically, or you're just looking for more general information, you can kind of just submit a form to that and then it'll be dispersed to the proper person who will reach out to you. Well, I mean, when we do that, we get back to someone normally within the day, if not it's the next day. All right. Thanks, Dan. Be sure to visit tracktel.com. And as always, you can get a hold of myself or Kevin or any of our other experts at mozillacompanies.com. Don't forget to pop into our learning center. We have a ton of information on fall protection there. Subscribe to Safety Factor wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also watch it on the Lifting Rigging channel on YouTube. Thanks for listening and stay safe out there.